Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg. I'm so happy to be joined today by the distinguished author and playwright Sarah Rule. Sarah's a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and her plays include In the Next Room or The Vibrator Play, Clean, The Clean House, and most recently, Stage Kiss and Dear Elizabeth. I first became super aware of Sarah's work when uh, the Dalai Lama was in town and one of her plays, um, The Oldest Boy, which involves Tibetans and the Tulku system, was at Lincoln Center. And I kept watching people like the Dalai Lama's translator go off and see this play, which very sadly I didn't have time to go see, but I do have a copy of the written script. She's currently on the faculty of the Yale School of Drama and has been the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, the Helen Merrill Emerging Playwrights Award, and the Whiting Writers Award. Sarah is the author of several books, including her collection of essays, 100 Essays I Don't Have Time to Write, which is great. It's a great title, which was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2014, and most recently, Letters from Max, a book of friendship, co-authored with the poet Max Ritvo. Welcome to the Meta Hour, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a great delight. I was saying earlier to you when we were just chatting that if somebody had asked me when I was a child what I wanted to be when I grew up, I'd say a playwright. Which makes you very singular. <laughs> How special. <laughs> because it's almost like a like quilt making or something. It's so <laughs> anachronistic these days. You know, and I, I really couldn't even say why, but even in this process of, um, you know, books and uh, magazine articles or whatever, it's still in me. It's mm. just this little, I don't know if it's the collaborative part of it, although mm-hmm. that's scary too, right, to mm-hmm. create something and turn it over. I want to talk to you about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's something about it that draws me still. Well, there's something about the live presence, which I imagine with your practice, I mean, it's something that you can kind of mainline in the theater, the whole idea of presence. And and of course, it's embodied, which is tricky, Mm -hmm. but which also also has great, great delight for me to collaborate with actors and designers and see everything in three-dimensional space embodied. So when you're writing... um... Is your mind going there to the whole production? You You know, it's not. When I'm writing, it's usually in some kind of platonic world where I see imagery and I see things happening. But it's not, I don't imagine sort of the the thingness of the thing, like the, the actual apple prop that would become my platonic ideal of an apple. Or I don't imagine, you know, the configuration of the theater. I just imagine kind of pure space where it's all going on. Mm hmm I think I do that in writing as well, mm-hmm. actually. Um, and there's something about, I know that of my colleagues, you know, when you're recording something, like if you're recording the audio version of a book, uh, for example, it's very difficult for some people because you're in a way talking to nobody. <laughs> you know, you're like talking <laughs> to the wall often, you know. Yeah. And uh, But somehow it's it's a talent of mine, really, you know, <laughs> to, talk to, to talk to nobody. To nobody. You know, it's the oddest <laughs> thing, like. You know, oh, record this. Okay, you know, mm-hmm. and but I, it's like torture for some people because they just can't. They don't feel the connection. It's such an interesting, just uh, phrase talking to nobody. I mean, I think as writers we do that all the time in our mind, and maybe we're talking to ourselves, or maybe we're talking to everybody, which mm-hmm. is like talking to nobody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something like that. <laughs> I mean, the ability must derive from something like that. In my really when I teach at um, at Yale School of Drama, I tend to make them write gift plays so that they have an actual person they're addressing early on, just so that they're reminded that it's not a solipsistic act of creation, or it doesn't have to be. That it can have a person that you're addressing, and I think that in playwriting we seldom do that because we're thinking of sort of a wide audience who comes in to see your play. So. I mean, with poetry, you often have a person who's being specifically addressed, but in mm-hmm. playwriting, not as frequently. Now, that's interesting because I was like, I still dance with the idea of writing a play. You must. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to sit at your feet. Um, 
you know, and people say scary things to me like, well, you're supposed to tell the story that scares you. You know, you're supposed to go to like your hardest place. And I think, I don't feel like it. <laughs> you know, like. I mean, you could or you could not. <laughs> I yes. definitely don't. I don't give that advice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, so, first of all, I don't know how to write a play. So that's a whole new form. And then on top of that, the scariest story is like, wait a minute. I also have to say, I have a wonderful teacher, Paula Vogel, and she's really the reason I started writing plays. But she would always say... Did you go to Brown? I did. (laughs) She would say, if I... She wrote this play called Baltimore Waltz about her brother, Carl, who died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. And she said, if I thought to myself, I'm going to write a play about my brother, Carl, who I loved more than anything who died of AIDS, I never would have gotten out of bed. So instead, I decided to write a play about a, a woman who goes traveling in Europe, and then I wrote a play about my brother, Carl. Right. So she yeah. was always about how do you approach it indirectly, you know, rather nice. than go to the scary, dark place. Mm-hmm. Really actually leave that stuff alone, like leave it to the side and concentrate on some other formal gesture. All that stuff emerges anyway. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Oh, well, she's the genius. She's the master. In Is fact, she still if, teaching at Brown? Yes. Well, not at Brown, but she does these boot camps in um, all over, but also in Provincetown. Uh-huh. So if you want to write a play, my, my first suggestion is go okay. study with Paula. I will. I will. I saw one of her plays recently, um, Indecent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. It was magnificent. Yeah. Sort of learned a little bit more about her. Mm-hmm. Well, that's part of my, you know, my process in here is that um, I officially live in Barry, Massachusetts, uh-huh. which is next door to the Insight Meditation Society. Right. Uh, it's where I vote. It's the only place I've ever uh-huh. voted. We've, we've, we've been there for, you know, forever, for uh, over 40 years. So. Mm-hmm. And um, I was writing a book called Faith, which came out on my 50th birthday, which was some years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just felt like I needed to get out of that home even though it was tranquil and it's you know mm-hmm. it's country it's beautiful it's uh, everything you sort of dream about and I thought I need to be away uh-huh. I have a friend who was going up to Barry um to the Insight Meditation Society to sit for three months so should I take my apartment which is on 9th Street and 5th Avenue mm-hmm. <laughs> so I I grew up here but the first for the first time as an adult I really moved back mm. and it was fantastic mm-hmm. and part of why it was fantastic was because as I started teaching I was I was teaching more writers and mm. uh, publishers and mm-hmm. people, actors, you know, people mm-hmm. in creative realms, and began thinking of myself differently mm-hmm. in in doing that. And uh, ever since then, you know, it, it's been a real fascination of mine mm-hmm. um, to see the creative expressions that people go through. And mm-hmm. and you don't need me to tell you it's a tough world, you know. Like if I see an actor <laughs> working anywhere, I think, thank goodness, yeah. someone has a job. Oh God, you know? absolutely. You know, and, and to feel what compels people, you know, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, speaking of faith, I, I mean, I do think it's it's interesting that um, Western theater has become so secular. And I think part of it is that it's a kind of religion for most people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they need faith to keep them going in yeah, it because yeah. it is so difficult. Yeah, it, it is very difficult, for sure. And, and at the same time, it's like... Um, one of the things I encounter a lot as a teacher, you know, especially of meditation, like, is people saying, um, well, it comes in different forms. If someone is in a creative realm, they'll say, I don't know about this. So I might get too mellow, you know, like, don't I need anguish and art and <laughs> for my art to flourish? And where am I going to pull it out from? Right. It's not these really painful places. And I was once in a, uh, in a room, an auditorium, watching a panel with the Dalai Lama on it. And it was the Dalai Lama and Alice Walker and Richard Gere, and that was the first question. Mm. What uh, did the Dalai Lama say? Well, he was puzzled. He was uh-huh. like, he said, basically, he said, people keep taking me places to show me things, mm-hmm. and he, you know, and they want me to say, oh, it's so beautiful. Mm. Um, and he said, in Tibet, we believe that the worth, the value, the beauty of a work of art depends on the transformation the artist went through in creating it. <gasps> oh. So if the artist went through good changes, then that's a beautiful work of art. And, you know, so everyone was like sitting there. So and he was sitting beautiful. There. Yeah, very different. 
Well, I remember when I was working on this play, The Oldest Boy, um, which involves this this boy who gets identified as a tulku and his parents have to decide whether to send him to India to be educated or not at a monastery. Um, I was interviewing all these Tibetan dancers because there was Tibetan dance in the play and we wanted to incorporate actual authentic Tibetan dance. And I remember, you know, talking to some of these women who would say, who would seem so puzzled just by the the professionalization of art that, that, that like not in its ritual context, mm-hmm, they'd say, mm-hmm. Oh, well, I could come do it, you know, once a week and, you know, from three to five mm-hmm. and I'd say, Oh, we would have to do it every day and for three months. <laughs> and they said, well, I couldn't possibly. And, and then they would say, well, so when I commit to do a dance, it's for an occasion, it's for say a welcome dance for the Dalai Lama and that's its purpose and its function. Or we have a dance that, um, where we are welcoming someone to their home and then we use a stick in the dance that prepares the ground for the home. Um, And I remember them saying, so what kind of wedding dance would you want us to do? And I said, well, just the most beautiful one. And they looked at me again, puzzled. Well, what do you, what do you mean the most beautiful? Um, They said it, what matters is where the character's from. Where's the character from? Are they from Lhasa or are they from Amdo? And then I can tell you what kind of wedding dance. I'd say, well, which one's more beautiful? And they say, what are you talking about? Tell me where the character's yeah. from, and then I'll tell you what the dance does. Yeah. And that was so beautiful to me and really such a lesson about how confusing it is to make art in a secular world where it is yeah. divorced from function. I mean, we have this vague idea that it's important, transcendent. It gives people meaning. But it, it it doesn't have as clear a purpose. Yeah, and it's also interesting to me that um, when I think about social movements, social justice, you know, change, um, especially because I'm asked so much about it these days, you know, like how can your inner work uh, make a difference mm-hmm. in the world? And uh, so many times we identify social change uh, with like protesting or marching or picketing and I think of art. It's the first thing I think of mm-hmm. as forming a new boundary or a new image of what might be possible mm. or, or describing what is in a way that maybe not everyone has the courage to do. Mm. And, um, so I really see it as a revolutionary form, mm-hmm. whatever. Yes. And I, I mean, I, I feel like so many people are so filled with rage right now politically, and I, I count myself among them. Um, but I remember going to a meditation class in my early 20s, and at that time I was enraged about Bush's war in Iraq, and the class was specifically about anger and how anger wasn't so great. And I remember arguing with the teacher and saying, but come on, don't you need anger for um, for political rage and for efficacy and, and to fuel one sense of activism? And he said, no, no, you don't. Why is that helpful? You'd say you can be angry, but you can do you can make your action, and the anger stays over here. It's actually not that useful. And that was fascinating to me because all my life I had really thought of rage as the fuel for these social, um, the, these social activists, these social movements. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, a lot of times it is, I think, it, mm-hmm. you know, and for each of us, a lot of times it is. But um, there's something about that seeming paradox that's very important for this time. Like mm. people right after the election would say to me, you know, they were enraged. And Mm -hmm. six months later, people were saying, I can't bear my own mind anymore. Mm. You know, I can't bear looking at my thoughts because they're all enraged. And so Mm -hmm. the toll Mm. was becoming more apparent, Mm -hmm. you know, as time went on. And so it's finding that energy Mm -hmm. to say, I don't agree with this. I think this is wrong. People are being hurt. Let Mm -hmm. me help. Um, And at the same time, not to get lost, you know, in, in some kind of identification with that because... Uh, it's so destructive. And well, and if you're mentally dominated, that's one extra form of domination. Yeah, that's <laughs> There's true. There's so many other horrible forms it's right true. now. It's true. It's true. Yet one more. <laughs> I know, one more. So which came first for you, writing or meditation? Writing. Um, I, I've always written something or other since I was about five, mostly poetry and mm. short stories. And then when I met Paula Vogel, I became a playwright. And I think it was around that time I went to that class when I started meditating mm-hmm. in my twenties. And what kind of meditation were you interested in? I was pretty um, ecumenical. I I kept trying mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. different kinds, and interestingly, the oldest boy was kind of a tipping point for me. Um, and 
it's interesting. So I keep thinking about what you said about what the Dalai Lama said that mm -hmm. it's the artist's transformation yeah, that's the measure. Incredible. It's yeah. amazing. And at the start of that play, so I started the play because I have a babysitter, Yang Zum, and she's the one who told me a story of friends in Boston who had had this actual experience of having a child identified as a tulku. And I thought, oh my God, and how could you give your child away? And I was so intrigued. And then I did tons of research, sort of bundlefuls and suitcasefuls. And by the end of my research, I decided to, to take refuge as, as a Tibetan Buddhist, <laughs> which was not <laughs> what I expected, right, right. you know. Well, you know, somebody like the Dalai Lama, I think, shows, a, um, you know, a, a kind of courage or, or lucidity. You know, because there he is in this situation and asks a certain question, which made no sense to him. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to fudge it, you know, uh -huh. he said, that makes no sense to me. Yeah. You know, I just don't get it. And it reminds me of, you know, a long time ago, like 1989 or 90, I was in a conference with him in India. And I asked him a question. I said, your holiness, what do you think about self-hatred? Mm -hmm. And he said, what's that? I remember reading you know, about that. That's yeah. quite amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> that there's so much more self-hatred in the yeah. West. Yeah. I mean, that's not to deify any culture like Tibetan culture because certainly there are enough problems, but there's something about that rock-bottom belief about what you'll find if you look at the deepest level of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and is it something with capacity for love and mm -hmm. connection or is it some miserable, you know, mm -hmm. you know, thing? And in terms of that notion of the artist being transformed by the art, I do, I remember telling my students at some point that there are certain plays you write in your life that teach you how you're going to live, that, that that get you through a chapter in your life that teach you something you didn't know about yourself. And I don't think it's every play, but I think there are sort of very particular plays in a playwright's career that, mm -hmm. that teach you how to live. Mm -hmm. And others don't. Do you remember seeing something yourself that was sort of... Instructive, uh, instructive in that way? Instructive in that way. Well, I wonder if it... If if the audience counts, I mean, I guess I was thinking of the relationship between the artist and the play. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly there are, there are plays that have made a big impact on me, and I remember when I saw Paula Vogel's Baltimore Waltz, and it was just mm -hmm. in a tiny yeah. little college yeah. production at yeah. Brown, and I just remember weeping. And at the time, my father had just died of cancer, mm -hmm. and I was sad mm -hmm. about that. Um, but it was something about how Paula was dealing with grief that resonated with me personally. And then shortly thereafter, I met her and she became my teacher. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, in a way, you know, those are the universals, right? It's grief, it's mm -hmm. letting go, it's our vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It's These are the places we could come together mm -hmm. and, like, find one another. And they're also the places where we maybe feel most isolated because mm -hmm. we're not taught that it's right to come together, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you have to hide that, that's shameful, or mm -hmm. tuck them away. They're too, they're too much in pain. You know, it's displeasing. And I've never really understood that and and how strange our culture is about death and how we're so afraid to intrude on other people's grief. I've mm -hmm. never really understood. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's well, I was raised from a certain age by my grandparents, you mm -hmm. know, and, so that's Eastern European immigrants, and mm -hmm. uh, my mother had just died, you know, mm -hmm. when I was nine, and so, uh, and they never really spoke about her mm -hmm. because they thought that would upset me, mm -hmm. you know, that was the right thing to do from their point of view. So, and I was just telling someone the other day that I, I am of an age and you know conditioning, so that <clears throat> I never heard the word cancer said out loud. Mm. Oh God! And I was like whisper. Right, in that Woody Allen like, movie. Cancer. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I went to teach just a few years ago at the University of Virginia. Uh, nursing school, and we went to their hospital, and you know, I was on the oncology ward and speaking to the um, staff there, and and I found myself wanting to drop my voice. I, <laughs> oh, this is like cancer, <laughs> you know, and and I brought it up, and yeah. and most of the physicians were younger, you know, not to have quite the same exact conditioning, mm -hmm. but they knew what I was talking about mm -hmm. because I mean, what an odd thing, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, wait a minute, you know, isn't this like? A universal possibility, you know? Like. Right. And when you can't say it, I think it acquires power, like Voldemort and Harry yeah. Potter. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just name it. Yeah. 
which brings us to meditation, you know, which, is, right. which certainly some forms of meditation are based on exactly that. Let's just name it. Mm-hmm. You know, like this is my experience. This is what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. And then looking at all that we may be adding to it. This is the only experience I'll ever have, or I'm the only one, or mm-hmm. I should be able to stop this, or, you know, mm-hmm. all this sort of extra. Well, and I love in your writing the way you teach people to reframe stories and to create new stories out of stories that have become ossified. Mm-hmm. Like, I am incapable. <laughs> <laughs> that one. <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, when, you know, when I was first, um, not even first teaching, before I, I thought of myself as a teacher, uh, I was living in India, and I decided to live in India forever. I had to come back, but uh, I thought after that, you know, I'll just stay in India. So I went to see one of my teachers, this woman named Deepama, um, who lived in Calcutta. And I was telling her, just I'm going for a brief period back to the States, mm-hmm. and I'll be back here. And, and she said, well, when you go back, you're going to basically stay there, and you can teach. And mm-hmm. I said, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> she said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. Yeah. And we went through it. And finally she said two things to me which were amazing. Usually I focus on the first, but, you know, this is sort of equal, uh, equally important in terms of the second. She said, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach, mm. which I considered sort of an amazing statement, you know, instead mm. of like your attainment is so dazzling, you know. Like, right. It was like you really understand suffering. That's a credential. Yep. Um, and then she said, you can do anything you want to do. It's mm. your thinking you can't do it that's going to stop you. Mm. Uh, and I walked down those stairs thinking, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. And mm-hmm. sure enough, as I came back and life unfolded mm. in such a way that it was quite a long time. But one morning I woke up and I thought of her statement. I thought mm. oh, she was right. So beautiful. And I do think sometimes our teachers give us permission to teach. And we wouldn't, I mean, it's, it's easy to go through life thinking of yourself as a student and not a teacher. And I mm-hmm. think it's actually very hard to make that transition. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's the teacher who allows you to. Do you actually teach playwriting? And, I yeah. do. And in, in fact, it was Paula, funnily enough, um, who she was taking a sabbatical from Yale. And at the time I had, I have three kids and I had two very little twins at the time. And, and Yale called and said, could you substitute for Paula for a semester? And I said, oh, God, I never thought I'd teach with kids this young. I don't know. Um, and then, but sort of for Paula, I would do anything. So I did. And in fact, I found I absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And it was a good contrast from the crazy domestic sphere that I was in at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. well, actually I'm still in, but it was more (laughs) extreme when the babies were little. And Paula, meanwhile, found that she really enjoyed having the time off to write. (laughs) So then I, I just kept teaching. So I've been Mm -hmm. there for about eight years and that's where I met, um, Max, who um, I wrote this book with. Yeah, I want to get to that in a minute. And just before then, let me ask, yeah. do you see phases? I'm, I'm interested, of course, in what holds people back, like mm. your students, what you know keeps them from a full, more full mm-hmm. flowering of their ability. And mm-hmm. also, do you see waves or trends in that? You know, mm. In terms of the second, I would say, um, when someone comes to the Insight Meditation Society for a longer retreat, mm-hmm. uh, there's a form that they fill out. Um, and in the back of the form, we ask what uh, psychiatric medications one may be on, just mm-hmm. so that we know. And um, so there was one day, one year, not too long ago, I was flipping through just the back of the forms. And I saw, you know, anxiety medication, anxiety medication, anxiety medication, anxiety medication. And I said to my colleague, what happened to all the depressed people? <laughs> you know, like, used to be antidepressant, antidepressant, you know. Or do they just call it something else now? Oh, well, that could it's be. It's like the that, same medicine. That does my whole theory, you know, like, wait a minute. You know, because I was really thinking, oh, maybe we're in the age of waves. anxiety We're in the now. age of anxiety, so. I think we are. I think that's about right. Yeah. So do you see certain patterns in people? Is there... Well, I read this study recently that concerned me, and I don't know really how you measure it, but that empathy was going down among the college-age population. Oh, really? Yep. And I've seen, you know, some instances of that. I don't know if I'd say say it globally, but I thought, well, that's almost as concerning about <laughs> as any other pressing social issue we have, like um, stopping guns because if people don't have empathy, 
they'll never have the wherewithal to empathize with people who get killed Mm -hmm. by guns and then want to put a stop to it. So I I kind of thought, well, that's a huge crisis. And why is that happening? And Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's interesting. I had, you know, people tell me about studies that uh, empathy about things like empathy going down in mm-hmm. medical professionals between mm-hmm. the time they start school and the right. time they end. But I hadn't really thought about. Yeah. Um, no, it is a huge issue because it's the core of so much, you know. Mm-hmm. Just... And I don't know. Maybe because it's the age of anxiety, it it um that creates an age of solipsism because you're so in your anxiety, you can't look outward. Mm-hmm. And it decreases your empathy. Do you think the heart of good writing is empathy? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard to teach. Yeah, I don't even yeah. know if it's teachable. That's interesting. It must be teachable. Because... It must be teachable, huh? Yeah. Well, you must teach empathy. I hope so. <laughs> 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 I hope it works. You know? <laughs> so in a way, you are the empathy teacher, or you do the best you can in conveying that value. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because otherwise wouldn't dialogue look like just unreal? Yeah, if you can't hear your character talk, you know, deep in the recesses of your brain, if you can't animate them, I mean, in a way, it's a failure of empathy. You could also call it not having a good ear. Um, But it's a listening ear. You're listening for the music of the speech, and you're also, you're also, you know, listening with your heart and your body to how the character feels. And, and that's what animates the character and gives them life. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. You know, so, <laughs> and then you're, you know, go back to the Dalai Lama again in that statement. I keep thinking about, sometimes, you know, like you go to the mat or you go to some gallery and you don't even know how the statue came to being, how many years it took the, the sculptor to create it, but you can't tear yourself away. You know, mm-hmm. you're just there. Mm-hmm. And so you can only imagine that that sculptor went through a lot in, mm-hmm. in creating that form, and that that's the gift. Mm-hmm. That's why you're mesmerized, is mm-hmm. because you're getting a little glimpse of what was likely their process. And I feel like you're mesmerized by their attention, too. You're mesmerized by their absolute focus. Yeah, yeah. Even if it took 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're... Book and you co-authored a book called Letters from Max, Book of Friendship. Can you tell us about how this book came into being? Yeah. So Max was this extraordinary student who walked into my classroom, and he was a poet, uh, and he wanted to take a playwriting class. And I remember at first he was in the no pile because he'd never written a play before. But I saw that he was in an experimental comedy troupe and was a poet. And I think those two things together sort of make a play. (laughs) So I put him in the yes pile. And he just had an extraordinary mind. And he was in remission from Ewing sarcoma, which he'd had as a teenager. And then at the end of the semester of our course, he had a recurrence. And um, he and I became close friends. And we wrote letters back and forth Mm -hmm. when he graduated from Yale and when he was in treatment. He was often traveling at the NIH or Mm -hmm. in L.A. And... So at a point we had amassed 200 pages or so of letters, some of them about the afterlife or meditation or poetry or soup, and um, we decided to make a book of them. Beautiful. Because you think of any time, you know, that should be when pretense drops away and we're just talking about attention and yes. presence, you know. And he was one of the most present people I've ever met, and the sicker he got, the more direct his gaze was. Uh-huh. It's very funny, you know, like if you have a glimpse of suffering of some kind, like you, um, I don't know, you're exposed in some way and then you're out on the street at the party, you know, mm-hmm. and you're like, whoa, you know, people live on a certain level. Uh-huh. But behind closed doors, there's plenty going on. Yeah. And I think because my own father had been diagnosed with cancer when I was 20 and I was in college. Oh, sorry. He died when I was 20, diagnosed when I was 18. I was acutely aware that at college... It's, it appears that no one's thinking about mortality. Um, and if you're in that mode of thinking about metaphysics and the afterlife and loss and everyone else is thinking about who they're going to sleep with and whether they're going to get an A on their, mm-hmm. you know, 
biology exam, it's incredibly alienating. So I think I felt also an empathy for Max and a desire to let him talk about those questions if he wanted to. And, you know, even depending on the society, there's even a kind of forced isolation, which, you know, takes a lot of work to, to break through. So I'm thinking of somebody who came to see me once and uh, she had this terrible tragedy which resulted in someone's death about six months before and mm. terrible. And she said to me, you know, uh, my friends are kind of in a mode of like, get over it already, would you? You know, mm. And I just looked at her and I said, this is not a six month thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then she said, what I don't believe for a moment, she said, my friends all have golden lives. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever goes wrong for them. And that's the pre, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the presentation, mm -hmm. you know, which is so often untrue. And she said, my friends all have golden lives. So now I represent like life gone awry mm -hmm. and they're very uneasy about me. So then I looked mm -hmm. at her and I had you know, one of those experiences where you just see these words come out of your mouth. So what I heard come out of my mouth was, I think you need new friends. Mm -hmm. And then I said, you should meet my friends. They're all a wreck. You know, like, <laughs> and every time I tell that story with friends in the room, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that exactly, you know. But it does get to be an mm -hmm. honesty, I found, mm -hmm. you know, through lots of different means, and certainly meditation is one of mm -hmm. them, where you just see, hey, you know, I'm really screwed up, or I'm really mm -hmm. afraid, or, mm -hmm. or this is hard, and mm -hmm. I need help you know, getting through this. and uh, But to see how rare that is in, in society, how difficult it is to find, is, it's just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And Max was not one for small talk. He was right in the in the big questions right mm -hmm. away. And, and in his poetry, too, you talked about in meditation the um, ability to name what's happening now. His poetry had that, or it has that in, in, in a glorious way where it was sort of, this is my body now. And also, you know, a sensuality about the body and pain and suffering, but really naming what was happening to him mm -hmm. at that particular mm -hmm. moment and not being afraid to name it. Is there a passage you want to read? Sure. Um, I thought I'd read a passage where we went back and forth about the concept of meta, since your show is right. it's named. The meta hour. Meta hour. Um, let's see. Uh, so this is fairly late in our correspondence. Um, was this like email or something? Or you know, it was email. And I, th I think the letters don't feel like email because, I don't know, because they were Max and he had a kind of old soul. But a lot of them were through email. So this is, he begins talking about a friend of his named Melissa who had, had died of Ewing sarcoma, which is what Max had. Today is the anniversary of Melissa's death. I did a meta meditation on a self-portrait she painted. Do you Tibetan Buddhists have metta? You go around three different faces you picture in your head. You start with a face you love, cough, sorry, I mean have positive feelings towards. You know how Zen is. I use you mm -hmm. often. <laughs> then after a few minutes, you move to a face that's relatively neutral, like a grocery store clerk you saw that day, or John Kasich. <laughs> Max is so incredibly funny. Um, then you move on to someone you have a, quote, complicated and turbulent relationship with. For me, this is almost an invariably an X. As you look at each face, you recite, I wish you peace, I wish you happiness, I wish you freedom from internal and external harm. I sometimes add, however you define it, the idea is that your natural compassion towards someone you love can teach you how to offer compassion to those you're having trouble with. It was so strange to do meta for a dead person. My first thought was, well, she is certainly more peaceful now than when I knew her and she was terrified of dying. And she's definitely not going to be internally or externally harmed unless her bones count as her because maybe they're being hurt by soil or bugs. But happiness, how on earth can a dead person be happy? Or are dead people always happy? I thought about when I'm happiest. It usually means nothing is going wrong in my head. I'm not anxious about anything. Life is pleasant when you're not anxious, sort of all on its own. If you're not anxious and there's a wall in front of you, you think, nice wall. And the creamy beige of the wall just sort of flows through you like vanilla ice cream. And that's, I think, what Buddha was talking about when he said desire causes all suffering, because anxiety is always a form of desire. I want this to go away. If only I had this. If only this were different. But is happiness just a negative state? 
I know there's ecstasy and joy, but I don't think that's what you're supposed to wish someone in meta. Actually, I think most of my ecstasy is just me realizing, oh shit, I'm really happy, and getting overwhelmed with how rare and strange that is. I remember one time teaching Victoria how to crab walk in our apartment, and then I realized it had been a good hour or two without an anxious thought. There hadn't been an intrusive need to change where I was in the world or who I was with. There was no tormenting memories of shameful things I'd done or people who'd wronged me. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm really happy. (laughs) And then I threw her on the couch, showered her with kisses, and started weeping and wailing with ecstasy. Teacher, what is happiness? Wow. Um, And then I can read a reply. It seems sort of banal after reading Max's. Um, You ask if the dead are happy and what is happiness. I think the poets know better what happiness is than philosophers do. Charlie Brown's friend said, happiness is a warm blanket. Say Shonagun has a list of things that give her pleasure, including piecing back together a letter that someone has torn up and thrown away and finding she can read line after line in it. She also has pleasure when someone she loves is praised by others or when someone she loves and who is far away is taken ill and news arrives that the illness has taken a turn for the better. And she says, when a poem that you've composed for some event is talked of by everyone and noted down when they hear it. This hasn't happened to me personally, but I can imagine how that would would feel. Um, Things that make me happy. When I wake from a nap and the light on my walls is bright with daylight. When my husband's eyes are alight with something he finds funny. When my children crawl into my bed and lie on top of me. When an old friend calls and I putter around and do dishes while catching up with them. Swimming magnolia trees in march a perfectly brewed cup of tea and letters from you max (laughs) wow it's so beautiful thank you it's so touching you i should probably say meta m-e-t-t-a yes meta uh is a word in pali the language of the original buddhist text and uh, is usually translated as loving kindness Mm -hmm. i've had scholars and translators say to me I've had scholars and translators say to me, just say love. Stop being so squeamish, you know. Will you tell me more about that? I'm so, I have such questions about that, about why love versus loving kindness. I mean, maybe it's because I was raised Catholic where it's all about love. And I feel like, how does that all get parsed out? Well, um, according to these translators, uh, the early uh, translators from Pali and Sanskrit were trying to distinguish the Buddhist perspective from the Christian perspective. Uh-huh. And so they weren't using love. They were mm-hmm. using loving kindness. I think you could really use either, of course. Mm-hmm. They're strange in different ways, you know. Right. Like loving kindness is odd just in that you so rarely hear it in casual conversation. Mm-hmm. So it might make the quality itself seem arcane and mm-hmm. removed from day-to-day life. Love is strange because it's so complex. Like what mm-hmm. in the world do we mean? Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, what we call love is so laden with conditions that right. it's bound to disappointment. Like, mm-hmm. I will love myself as long as I never make a mistake. Or, right. You know, I will love you as long as the following 15 mm-hmm. conditions are matter. Um, in the situation, part of what was coming up for me hearing you read was how I was when Ramdas, who was a very old friend of mine, had this massive stroke, mm. uh, which was almost, or maybe even 20 years ago now. And I can remember the conditionality that kind of kept coming up in my mind because, of course, I wanted him to be well. Mm. And then I realized I wanted him to be better than before. Mm. And I think the internal process he went through in receiving that from people was, first of all, gratitude because people loved him and wanted him to be well. But also it was like a little bit of a pressure, you Mm, know, like, mm -hmm. what if it doesn't work? You Mm -hmm. know, like, I remember visiting him once and people... We're sending him everything, you know, like herbs and things and salves and, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the day I was there, he got a bottle of Ganges water, water from the Ganges River, which said something like, take 15 drops of this and you'll definitely be walking again. Right. And I said to him, don't drink that. You know, <laughs> you'll get cholera if you drink that. Whatever you do, don't drink that. But it's like the pressure. Will mm-hmm. I be abandoned? Will I still mm-hmm. be loved? Am I still okay? Mm-hmm. Am I still of worth even mm-hmm. if I'm ill, if I'm not getting better? All of that, you know, so that's part of what came up in my mind. So to say metta itself rather than love hopefully takes it. There's no conditions. Yeah, there's no conditions. Well, and I think I felt as someone outside Max's inner circle, I mean, I think because 
you know, it, he had his family, he had his wife. Um, I was not related to Max. I felt an obligation to talk to him about things like death that he wanted to talk about, knowing that I wouldn't... <sighs> I, I mean, I think when you're very, very close to people, it's very hard to admit that they're going to die. To even say it out loud is kind of horrible. Yeah. So sometimes it takes someone outside of your circle to say, you and I both know you're probably going to die of this, and I'm happy to talk about it. It's not a burden to mm -hmm. me to talk about it. I think also of um, how many people I know who end up being hospice volunteers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to a person, they say they receive more than they give mm -hmm. because they are brought, we are brought to that kind of honesty ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. I'd rather talk about something else too, you know? Like, right. But here we are. Mm -hmm. And as uh, my friend Joseph Goldstein would say, we have a, a friend, uh, a good friend who just died at the age of 92, which is very different than mm -hmm. dying at the age of 25. Yeah. And <laughs> Joseph said to me, uh, we're in the queue. Mm. You know, and I realized that there are a lot of, um, I love that phrase, we're in the queue. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ways we try to serve or connect to people or be of help. But people can remain kind of the other, like it's mm -hmm. unlikely I'll end up in prison. I hope. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm working with people in prison, there's mm -hmm. still a little bit of a, mm -hmm. it's not going to be me, you know. Mm -hmm. But dying, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's like we're all in the queue. So of all things, all ways we can connect are all times we can connect mm -hmm. uh it, it's fascinating you know that because we're right there mm -hmm. yeah you know and i can't even imagine having the kind of presence and that he's showing in that passage you know at the age of 25 oh it's he was astonishing um bringing up hospice that makes me think i should read his poem called hospice okay, if we yeah, have time oh, great. should i let's see if i can find it i didn't mark that one and this I think you'll know better than I will what the reference is to what sutra. Uh, okay, it's called hospice. My head is a bed on fire. You leave the bed and leave me without thought. The springs want to embrace each other, but they're afraid if they break their spiral, they will never be able to hold anyone. I wish you would let me know how difficult it is to love me. Then I would know you love me beneath all that difficulty. You are tending not only to me, you tell me, but to your other child, Air. And Air puts his feet in my slippers, and Air scrubs his teeth on my brush. And wherever my demands are not, there are his. And we must learn to share a bed. We must learn to share a body. The money is running low. We will have to split one needle this winter, one end for me, one end for Air. Mm. <laughs> And he was a beautiful, beautiful poet. Yeah, really, because that's like the reality, right? Mm -hmm. In the, in the symbolism, there's like, yeah, mm -hmm. the money's running low. Mm -hmm. This is what we face. It's not just the pain or the, even the loss, but it's like, oh, there's that circumstance mm -hmm. creeping up. Mm -hmm. Incredible! What a time to you know be close and to. It was. It was a complete gift. His friendship and. And, you know, one other astonishing thing about Max was I think writing for him was a kind of raft that kept him alive, that kept him afloat. And he wrote two extraordinary books, you know, in a very short amount of time. And one he was able to hold in his hands before he died called Four Reincarnations, which is a beautiful book. And the other one his teacher edited after he died called The Final Voicemails. Um, and usually it takes a poet two years to write in a second book of poetry after mm. the first one because the first one... You know, you have this backlog <laughs> right. energetically. But he really, um, because he was so present, there was a kind of generativity where anything he said, in a way, could be construed as poetry. Mm -hmm. He did this talk at the Rubin um, about Max and also with this woman who studies Japanese death poetry and these haikus that these monks write, mm -hmm. you know, these epiphanies. And um, I was talking to my mother about it, and she said, well, did Max write? a death poem, and I kind of said, well, the whole last two years of his mm -hmm. life he was doing that. Yeah, yeah. And may we all, you know? Yeah. Like, so I keep thinking, where was I at 25? I had just oh, started my God. the Insight Meditation Society 
Which we started, I was 23 when we began it. Well, that's a pretty big deal thing to do when you're 23. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a pretty big deal. <laughs> but it was all, you know, a life. It's just like you take the next step. You have no idea where it's going. Like, people say to us all the time, like, you must have had such vision. You must have had such courage. And I say, well, not really. You know, like. Just doing what you were doing. Just doing what we're doing. And How old were you when your teacher said you need to go teach? 21. 21. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's young to be a teacher, to feel like you have yeah. authority. Yeah, well, I went to India when I was 18, so. Yeah. But still, three years of practice is not that much. So. Mm -hmm. But here we Time are. Time is relative, <laughs> I yeah. guess. Yeah. That's fantastic. It's been so lovely to meet you. And... Oh, you too. It's such an honor, really. Such oh, well, a privilege. thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go home and read your play and <laughs> write one of on my own when I finish this book. Please do. <laughs> And I'm going to look up Paula Vogel. I'm going to go, go to her boot. She calls them boot camps. Okay. Go to a Paula Vogel boot camp. So thank you so much for really taking the time to speak with me today. To learn more about Sarah and her incredible work, visit her website at www.sarah, that's with an H, mm -hmm. <laughs> S-A-R-A-H, <laughs> rule R-U-H-L, playwright.com. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com. <laughs>